myself either. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Corey Farver. I am the other Corey. Um, right there. Um, today we are going to be reading Acts chapter 16, and this is that part where I say, guys, go grab a Bible if you don't have one. We have some in the back. If you brought your own, awesome. If you have it on your phone, awesome. If you brought your own scroll, that's awesome too. You can bring out your scroll. Um, if you have a scroll, show me because that's really cool. Um, but yeah, so today, the big idea that I want to talk about is that freedom is found through believing in Jesus. Simple enough, freedom is found truly through believing in Jesus. And I want to start by throwing out a question to y'all. Have y'all ever been falsely accused of something? Maybe it was a parent, maybe it was a spouse, maybe it was, I guess it wouldn't be a spouse for y'all. In my case, it may have been. Um, Maybe it was a, a friend or a teacher, whoever it was, but maybe they said something that you did, but you know in your heart you didn't, and then maybe you got in trouble for it. It happened to me. Um, so I've been sent to the principal's office in my life one time. It was in kindergarten, and uh, my parents took me out of public school the next year, so for whatever that's worth. Um, but so I was in kindergarten. I got sent to the principal's office, and then I got sent home for the day, so it was a big deal. And the principal told my mom, they're like, hey, your son told another kid he's going to hell. <laughs> so my mom's like, okay, let's chat. And she sits me in the big chair, you know, like that big chair at home. And she's like, okay, tell me what happened. I'm like, mom, no, 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 no. They got it totally wrong. I was talking to another kid in class, and I was making a friend, and he told me he's a Muslim. And I was like, okay, well, you know, just so you know, if you're a Muslim, that means you don't believe in Jesus if you don't believe in Jesus, then you don't get to go to heaven. And if you don't go to heaven, and she was like, oh, okay. So first of all, really proud of you. That's cool that you shared that with another kid at school. Um, totally keep talking about Jesus, but maybe we leave that hell part out next time you go. And I was like, okay, next, whatever. Um, so yeah, anyways, didn't necessarily make a friend that day. But um, on a little bit more serious, a few years later, I was in middle school, I was on a baseball team, and we did that thing, I don't know if you guys have ever been on like a team or something before, where you're going to a game and you're like super carpooled in one car, like we'd get a minivan or like a Suburban, and we would fit like the entire team in the back where we were quadruple buckling and everything, totally not safe, glad the police officer's not in here, um, and and I was sitting towards the front, and there was a kid in the back. He said something really, really awful. I don't remember what was said, but in that moment, our coach was the one that was driving the car, and he turned around, and he's like, who's the one that said it? And then he's like, you know what? I don't even care who said it. Um, we're a team, and you guys are all responsible for whatever was said, and uh, you're all going to have to pay the punishment for it. So after that game, he pulled us aside that we're in the car, and he made us run extra laps uh, after the day. And Guys, if I were to tell you something about us Farvers, we hate running, like absolutely hate running. My mom, in fact, used running as a punishment for us. So when we get in trouble, she's like, all right, go take a lap around the street. And if it was really bad, it was two laps. So um, running was like the worst thing that could have been the punishment for me then. And I just remember running those laps, thinking about that kid and the thoughts that were going through my head were how much I didn't like him, how much I was like, this is not fair. I shouldn't be in this situation. Um, probably not the most pure thoughts that were going through me in middle school. Um, so today, as I mentioned, we're talking about Acts chapter 16, and Paul and Silas were in a very similar situation where they were accused of something that they didn't necessarily do. Um, and if we start in verse 25, they're actually in prison right now. So I do want to spend a couple of minutes to tell you guys how we got here. Um, so Paul and Silas, Silas is this guy that's been traveling around with Paul. I know we've talked about Paul plenty. Um, they're basically going around and they're planning all these small churches, right? So they're on this mission. They're making friends. They're starting churches. It's great. Uh, they head over to this place called Philippi, which today is modern day Greece. And uh, they go to this girl named Lydia's house and they end up starting this church at uh, Lydia's house and things are going great. Well, back and forth going, traveling to this house, they keep crossing this, this girl on the street. And when they cross this girl on the street, they realize that she's actually a slave. So yes, they actually had child slavery back then, which is awful. Um, but even worse, this girl had a demon inside of her. 
and the demon was giving these sort of demonic spirits that allowed the little girl to kind of be like a fortune teller. She could predict the future. Um, and their owners benefited off of that by having people come over. She would tell their fortune, and then they would make a bunch of money off of her. Um, so Paul, actually, it says over in verse 18, says he got really annoyed with her because she kept calling them out every time they walked by. I thought it was kind of funny that it says Paul got annoyed. Um, and he says, I command you in the name of Jesus to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. So very cool. Paul sees this girl that is in need. He tells the demon to get out of her. And they go along with their lives and everybody's happy, right? Except for those owners of the slave because in their minds, they just lost their income, right? These were the girls that, this is the girl that was basically bringing in all their their day-to-day needs because she was kind of their, their cash for what they needed. Um, and so they go out and they bring them in front of the magistrates. The magistrates were kind of like the local police, the law enforcers, and they point at them. They say something interesting in verse 20. It says, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. It's a very interesting thing. The first thing they say is these men are Jews. And I would read that today and be like, okay. Who cares? (laughs) Let's get on with it. Well, back in those days, Jews were viewed as the lower class. It was very okay to beat up a Jew, whereas if they were Roman citizens, you were kind of the upper class, and you weren't actually even allowed to get beaten up or thrown in jail without a proper trial first. And so um, now nobody went up to Paul and Silas and were like, you guys are not Roman citizens, you're Jews. No, they just went up and they started beating them up, and you read the next couple uh, verses that They tore off their clothes, they beat them up, and essentially it brings us to where we're at in verse 25, where Paul and Silas are thrown in prison, um, and they're there because they were doing God's work of getting this demon out of a girl um, that was a slave. So definitely had means to be like, what's going on? Why am I here? Uh, God, I was just following your mission, and now you've got me in jail. And not only are they in jail, so in Roman times, they had three levels of jail where it was like the the pretty good jail where you're outside. Then you had the darker jail with really, really strong bars. And then you had the third jail, which was essentially death row. And that's where Paul and Silas were placed. Um, And they were placed in these stocks that were put around them and put their feet and their arms in awkward situations. Uh, The intent was to cause constant agonizing pain to them. Which is awful. It was, imagine doing the splits like for hours on end, which for some of y'all, maybe you can do that. I can't do that. That would cause a lot of pain for me. Um, Paul and Silas were essentially forced to do the splits for like multiple hours in this awful jail cell and knowing that the intent was that they're going to be executed at some point. So that's where we come to in verse 25. And it says... About midnight, Paul and Silas were cursing the Lord and telling him, how could you do this to us? Oh, no, wait, I must have a different version. It says they were praying and singing hymns to God. Hold up, wait a minute. They're praising God even though they know they're following God's word and following what he wanted, and they brought them to this awful situation. It really made me feel bad reading that, knowing that I was upset over running on my baseball team, being like, wow, I did not think to praise God in that moment. So it says, they were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them, which I would imagine they were because they were in, again, an awful situation. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So an earthquake happens after that. That's pretty crazy. They're in jail, they're worshiping the Lord, and then this earthquake happens, which earthquakes may have been common back then, maybe they were, maybe they weren't. Regardless, I think there was some divine intervention into this earthquake because it says in the verse that immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds were unfastened. The fact that every single person's bond was unfastened and all the doors just opened, it wasn't just a hit or miss kind of thing. I don't know, I read that and I think clearly God was at work in this situation. Verse 27 brings us to the jailer's thought. So the jailer is the guy that's been sitting there watching these two crazy guys worshiping in an awful situation. An earthquake happens, and then all of a sudden, the prisoners are basically free to walk out as they want. 
So it says in 27, when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. This jailer's at the lowest point in his life, y'all. I mean, he is about to take his own life. And I can think of two reasons why. One, all these prisoners around him just got escaped, and the only thing standing between them and leaving is this poor jailer that's just standing there. Two, also in Roman times, if a jailer had any prisoners escape, their punishment for that was death. So this jailer's looking at it of, okay, either way out of this, I'm going to end up dying. I'd rather go out on my own terms. Like I said, he's at the lowest part of his life. Verse 28 says, But Paul cried out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for the lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I think that might be the most important question that you could ever ask someone. I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what we all want? Remember that thing I mentioned at the beginning, freedom is found through believing in Jesus. This guy's looking for that freedom. He's looking for, how do I get saved? Just a couple seconds ago, he was about to take his life. But Paul and Silas miraculously keep these prisoners all here. He said, we're still here. And the jailer's first question is, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31 says, and they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. What I love about that verse right there is how simple it is. It doesn't say, all right, so you got to go over and sacrifice this many things. Uh, go tell all your friends all your sins. Um, you know, you got to fast for this many days. No, it just says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Something simple enough that anybody could pick that up. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. Okay, so now the jailer's got his family there. And he took them in the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And they rejoiced along with the entire household that he had believed in God. What a crazy couple hours right there, y'all. We had Paul and Silas who were literally in an awful situation doing the splits in a dark cell knowing that they were about to be executed. They're singing worship songs, probably had Ben playing guitar or Micah playing guitar for them or something, I don't know. And then an earthquake happens. This jailer's about to kill himself and then he ends up finding Jesus and then his whole family finds Jesus and then they get baptized, and then I love the last part where it says, they rejoiced along with the entire household and took them in, into his house and set food before them. They partied after this. I mean, this was a celebration flat out because of what had happened. If I were Paul and Silas, I, my immediate response of being thrown in jail would not be to praise the Lord. But because they had that faith and trust and believing in Jesus, the craziness of what happened after is just, I don't know, it's remarkable to read. The verses after that from 35 to the rest of the chapter, I'm going to kind of sum up for y'all. It, it's really, really cool. Um, essentially, the next day, the magistrates, those law enforcers that were beating up Paul and Silas the day before, uh, they're like, oh my gosh, this is crazy what happened. We just had an earthquake. Our jail's completely destroyed. Paul and Silas, just get out of here. Like, we don't want you here anymore. Thanks for coming goodbye. And uh, Paul turns around and kind of throws a wild card that if you read it without context, you're kind of like, is that really the most Christian thing to do? So it says in verse 37, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us up publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. Did you catch that one part? It said men who are Roman citizens. Do you guys remember earlier I said, for Jews, you could beat them up, no problem. But Roman citizens, it was against the law to beat them up without a fair trial. So they just pulled this wild card on the magistrates and were like, no, you did us wrong. We weren't supposed to be in here. And not only that, I want you guys to give us a police escort out of here because we're going to be taken out in style. 
So you might be looking at that and being like, okay, is that really the most Christian thing to do? Well, as you read on, it says, so they took him out of the prison. The magistrates freak out at this point. They're like, please, just get out of here. We want you guys gone. Leave our city. We're super sorry. And it says, they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. That's that church that they had started at the beginning, that real small church. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. The reason why they wanted the magistrates to give them that police escort out of there is because they wanted to stop by Lydia's house first and make sure they knew, hey, they're with us. Had they not done that, when Paul and Silas left, that small church would have faced the same persecution that uh, Paul and Silas had just experienced. So essentially, this was their way of protecting that small church, again, believing that through this, they would be able to continue on with that church. So uh, I don't know, guys, as I'm reading through this and as we're going through Easter week, um, a lot of thoughts going through my head, and I'm thinking, you know, there's another person that also was falsely accused of someone of something, and, and that's Jesus, as, as a lot of us know in here. Jesus lived a perfect life. He came and, and did nothing wrong. He said that he was the king. He said that he's the Messiah, which he was and still is. And then he gets accused of speaking blasphemy, and he was crucified. He was tortured, beaten up, and then crucified. I mean, that is probably the worst situation that could have happened for anyone. And that's what we celebrate on, on Friday with Good Friday is the death of Jesus. And you might say, well, why is, it, why is it good? You know, it sounds awful that Jesus died. Well, it's good because that sacrifice was sufficient enough so that we can all believe in him and have that freedom, have that everlasting life. And then three days later, when you celebrate Easter, that's when Jesus defeated death. That's when he came back and rose again, proving that he is the Lord, proving that he's worth putting our faith in so that we can find that freedom. Paul and Silas were in an awful situation. They didn't deserve to be there. They were just following the Lord. They had faith in the Lord. And because of their, their faith and their trust in the Lord, God was able to use them for an incredible moment where an entire family was saved. An entire church was protected, and they were able to prove that message that I would encourage you guys to, to carry on throughout your own lives as you're going through crazy situations where people are accusing you of things or life just gets tough. But ultimately, you can know through seeing them and through how Jesus came to this earth that freedom is truly found through believing in Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for your sacrifice, for your love, for the examples that you provided for us in the Bible, and for ultimately being someone that we can truly rely on. I pray that as we go out today and go forth, that we would truly put our, our faith in you so that we know our true freedom is only found through you. God, thank you for this weekend with Easter. Thank you for sending your son who, who lived a perfect life and, and sacrificed himself for us. We love you. Amen. Amen. Corey, thank you, bro, for bringing, bringing